Amen. Amen. We got the call this afternoon from Sister Simpsonot, and the, devil, the the doctor had told her. Maybe I got it right the first time. Gave her some horrible news, and we just didn't accept that news. We we rejected it. Doctors can only go so far, but Jesus is the healer. How many's ever been healed? You know what I'm talking about tonight. And we're believing for her healing. We're believing for Brother Harper. And uh, he really needs a touch from God, too. Amen. I'd like to make a few announcements before I begin tonight. Um, I'd like to talk to you about the men's retreat, which will, I know, Brother Dave, uh, we talked about this. This is going to be September 6 and 7, and it's a Friday and Saturday, so I'm speaking to the men, aren't I? And uh, $30 includes all food. Everybody say all food and lodging. And so if you want to sign up for this, there will be a sign-up sheet. Brother uh, Duval can help you there. And uh, they've got Brother... Robert Henson from Flint, Michigan, coming down, as well as two other teachers. And I think it's going to be an excellent time for the men. And, and then the ladies' retreat will take place the next weekend, which will be September 13 and 14. You will say, why are you telling us so far out? It's not so far out. The older you get, the more you see the time flies. So for some of us, it's only three or four days away, <laughs> seems like. But uh, if you want to go to this, this is going to be in Lancaster, Ohio. And uh, the cost, I don't know, but it will be posted. And if you want to go, Sister Connie Hansen will have a sign-up sheet. And uh, the ladies are always blessed and fired up after they get back home from the ladies' retreat. And then that Sunday night, uh, the 15th, we're having Sister Kim, who's a missionary from South Korea. And this was going to be a special treat. Uh, she had a well-paying job with, I think, the government. And she gave it up. She sold her house and put the money into her church in South Korea. And I want you to know that this lady has had a very great success in her missionary life. And so we will be blessed by her coming here. We had to really work hard to get her here. Uh, but uh, Brother Lindner, who is the missions director, has been very helpful in allowing this to happen. Amen. Tomorrow, uh, James Johnson, who is the father of Dave Johnson, Brother David Johnson and his daughter, they sit over here, and she's in a wheelchair. He will be, uh, we will have the funeral for him tomorrow, and the viewing is at 10, say, 11, and the funeral is at 1 o'clock. And so if you would like to support that family, uh, I know that they would appreciate it very much. And the pastor of Jerusalem Apostolic, Pastor Frank uh, Tolliver will be uh, presiding over the funeral. Today we were at the funeral of Floyd McKinney. This is Brother McKinney's only living relative uh, of the immediate family. And uh, he, as he came into church Sunday night, I could tell he was kind of shocked. And I said, uh, are you okay? He said, I just got word that my brother passed away. Of course, it couldn't be announced uh, where the funeral was going to be because that wasn't determined until Monday. So I hope you'll pray for the for the McKinney family uh, as they go through this deep sorrow. He was deeply moved today, um, so I hope you'll keep them in prayer. Many things to pray for, but we have somebody who is touched by our infirmities. He has compassion on us. Amen. If you have your Bibles tonight, 
I'd like for you to turn to Matthew, the ninth chapter, and standing in for the pastor tonight, someone called me or sent me a text and said, will the pastor be there tonight? So I said what Jesus said, come and see. (laughs) Sorry to be a disappointment, (laughs) but I would rather he be up here too. (laughs) Amen. Amen. But we're going to look at the Word of the Lord here for a little bit tonight. Matthew, the ninth chapter. Uh, We look at verse 36, 9, 36 in Matthew. And then I'm going to also turn to Luke, the tenth chapter, verse 33. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them, because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep, having no shepherd. Then he said unto his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore, the Lord of the harvest, that he will send forth laborers unto his harvest. And then also in Luke, the tenth chapter, in verse 33. Actually, I'm going to read um, I'm sorry, I'm in Luke. I want to go to John. John 10:33 says, that is not what I want. Here it is. We're looking at the story of what's called the Good Samaritan. Now, Jesus didn't call him good because that would imply that there's a bad Samaritan. Whoever did the the um, dividing up of the of the Bible and putting putting uh, titles says causes the parable of the good samaritan but the problem is uh, jesus called him a certain samaritan which says that this is really a, a a true story jesus had a certain person a certain samaritan uh in mind you know the jews didn't think very highly of the samaritans because uh they were of a mixed uh, breed they were brought into the land as part of uh, the captivity that the northern uh, kingdom went into. And so they really uh, didn't worship God like they should. They had their own idea. But in verse 25, And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, or tried him, and said, Master, what shall we do to inherit eternal life? And he said unto them, What's written in the law? How readest thou? And he answered and said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy strength, with all your mind, and your neighbor as thyself. He said unto him, Thou hast answered, you've answered right, this do, and thou shalt live. Well, this young man should have known this because he was a lawyer. He understood the law, and so he was making himself look bad because he should have known this. So he, willing to justify himself, said to Jesus, well, who is my neighbor? And so Jesus said, a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves and stripped him of his raiment and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. And by chance there came down a certain priest that way, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. And likewise, a Levite, when he was at the place, came and looked at him and passed by the other side. The certain, but certain, but a certain, everybody say certain, Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him. And that's what I want to speak a little bit about here tonight. 
is compassion and a love for the lost. And I'm sure in every family represented here tonight, we have people who aren't serving God. So in this sense, spiritually, they're lost from God. Yet we don't write them off, do we? We pray for them. We have compassion on them. We're kind to them. And even when they oppose us for what we stand for and what we believe, we still love them. But then going outside the circle of the family, there are our neighbors, there are our friends, there are people that we work with that we should hold in the same level of love and respect. And Jesus would say compassion. Compassion is so important if we're going to love the lost. When you look at the definition of compassion, it says to have the bowels that yearn. Now, we don't use that word uh, that way in this day that we live in, but when the book was written, uh, when it was translated back in the 1700s, 1600s, 1700s, uh, it had a meaning that meant the innermost being, something that's deep inside, and we're asked to have this kind of compassion. Jesus had compassion on him. It's to feel sympathy, even to feel pity. And the kind that moves us, that the love that we have, that God has given us, it moves us to action, to do something about it. And the Lord will bring people across your pathway and my pathway that will cause us to feel this deep yearning deep inside and to love them with the love of Jesus Christ because we are feeling exactly what he feels when he looks at the lost. How many want to be involved in God's great program of redemption? It's something that we can involve ourselves in every day. And love, really, compassion is really love in action to feel sympathy. I guess I got started thinking about this. Uh, we were at a, a funeral Saturday in Indianapolis. Uh, I think Brother and Sister Bowler would know this lady. She was one of the Davis sisters that used to sing, uh, one that's related to Sister Harry Slattery. And this lady lived to the ripe old age of 98 and praying for her grandchildren and her children and great-grandchildren. In fact, she kind of went down after she heard that her last grandson had received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And she lay there on that bed and just gave the Lord thanks. It was kind of like her, was her, her, her key to, now I can go home. Thank God for grandmothers that pray for the grandchildren and take a stand for truth and righteousness. And so we bury this dear sister after all these years, uh, I felt close to her because uh, my grandfather was an elder in the church for Brother Harry Slattery in Heron, Illinois, Radio Tabernacle. And, uh, of course, the whole family was there. It was a great reunion. But I'm glad that we know that that's not the end of the story. That's just that's only the beginning for her. But someday, if we stay faithful to the Lord and do what we know according to his word, there's going to be a great reunion day when the Lord calls the church home. I believe in the coming of the Lord. How about you? And I'm telling you, the things that are happening today, I don't think that's very far away. This is not a day to stand down and to back up and, and uh, I'll do it tomorrow. Today is the day of salvation. And we need to love the Lord with all of our heart, soul, and mind. Can you say amen to that? Amen. If you do, the Lord will help you. And so on Saturday night, we were coming home. We were tired. Uh, we got halfway here, or just about uh, 10 miles on the other side of, of uh, uh, what? Greensburg. That's right. I'm glad my wife is here tonight, that I can still see her lips <laughs> at this distance. <laughs> But the biller knows what I'm talking about. <laughs> I, can't, I can't sing a song I lip read. 
And, and if she if she covers her mouth, I can't say. At least the words I can hum. But uh, we were tired, and we pulled into a gas station, which normally I stop there, and and uh, we went inside. I went to the restroom, and she went to uh, the little restaurant. There are two uh, restaurants there, and and she went to pay for her sandwich. And lo and behold, her purse or her wallet, she calls it a wallet. I call it billfold. But she had left it in the car. And I was taking my time. And there she was. She had her order. And she was telling the lady, I, I don't have my money. I would have liked to have seen that, but I didn't. <laughs> and so uh, she was kind of at a loss of what to do. So a young man behind her stepped up and said, I'll pay for that. She said, no, no, my husband's in the restroom. He will be right out. Well, I wasn't right out. He said, no, no, I'll, I'll, I'll pay for it. Don't you worry about it. And so he paid for it. And when he paid for it, he told her, Jesus loves you. And she said, you know, Jesus loves you too. Now, this young man was not in the church. But he had a real hunger for God, we found out. And so they went and they sat down on the McDonald's side, which is my side. <laughs> she, got the, she got the healthy food and I, I got the other food. <laughs> and when I walked around the corner, there she was, sitting there across the table from this young man. In fact, we prayed for him tonight. His name is Matthew Blaine. And so when he started talking, you know, I didn't know him. And uh, first of all, I insisted that he take uh, the, the money and, and refund. He didn't want to take it, but I said, no, no, no. Uh, please take this. And, uh, and then we started talking. And we found out that this young man had uh, some very serious issues in his life. And he wasn't running from them. He was confronting them. His wife was in another part of the state of, Ohio, uh, of Indiana. And uh, they were separated because of problems. And uh, every now and then he'd quote a scripture. He didn't get it exactly right, but he knew a little bit of the word because he had, he had finally realized that if he's going to get any help, it had to be from God. And the more that he talked, my whole attitude and disposition towards him changed because he wasn't just taking up time, but there was something here that he was searching for. And the more that he talked, we all ended up in tears a couple of times. And finally, I, we were telling him that what you really need is a baptism of the Holy Ghost. And when you repent of your sins and you're baptized in the name of Jesus, you can receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost because your sins will be forgiven. I said, you can find that in Acts, the second chapter. And when I said that, he reached down into his pants and pulled out a little New Testament that you could see was dog-eared, marked up, he even had, uh, even had things marked out with pieces of paper so he could turn to them right away. And I thought, here, here is a young man that when we talked to him, he was searching for answers. And anything that you would say to him, he was like a little bird. He'd just take it in. A few times I felt like he was staring right through me because he was so intense and so hungry. Now, mind you, we were tired. But you know, when you talk to somebody like that, no resistance, just an open door, whew, something happens. You feel the boldness of the Holy Ghost. I felt energized. And so, after about an hour and 15 minutes, I said, you know, Matthew, you need to be in church tomorrow. Saturday night now. 
he had a little, well, actually a brand new scooter. Okay, he's he's way out in Greensburg. That's quite a distance. I don't think I want to be on the interstate driving a little bitty, little bitty nothing. He said, "Oh, I can, I can go and I can go on the back roads." Well, that's still quite a distance, even on back roads. I said, "You know what? We have a church and a pastor in the city of Greensburg, which is just ten miles down the road." And I said, he said, you know, this meeting that we have, he said, I really believe it's from God. Now, this guy doesn't have any affiliation. He, he would tell you he doesn't go to church. But all he knew was is that he needed God and his only hope was in God. So I took down his... His name, his address, he was staying at a little campground just down the road. I'm sure it wasn't, wasn't costing much. And his telephone number. And uh, we, we got on home. I think we got home about 11 o'clock at night or 1030 at night. And so I looked in my ministerial manual, and here is Brother Siemens, who was used to be the district secretary of the Ohio, um, uh, Indiana district. And I called him. I said, there is a young man 10 miles east of you that you need to contact because he is searching for God, and this is no joke. <laughs> you know what Brother Seaman did? He hung up the phone and dialed that young man, and they talked for another half an hour, and he gave him directions to the church. Church starts at 10. He was there at 9.30 which means he had to leave way before 9.30 to get there. And when he got there, uh, he sought out the pastor, and they talked a little bit before service. And then when they, they started singing and all, and the Lord, you know how the Lord moves when we have a good worship service. And Brother Seaman was going to introduce him to the congregation. He looked, and lo and behold, he was gone. He said he was sitting there one minute, and the next thing I knew when I turned my eyes, I looked back, and he was gone. He said, so I walked down. I started looking for him. There he was between the pews on the floor seeking God because he knew that only God could help him. And only God can help people like that. And when you're, people, when you're with people like that, your heart goes out to him. Several times while we were talking to him, I couldn't help for the tears to flow. Uh, I'm a weeper anyway, so. But then my wife was crying, and even the young man stopped at one point with tears in his eyes. And he said, I can feel God here. At the conclusion of that service, he was baptized in Jesus' name. Well, I thank the God. I, I thank the Lord for that. And can I tell you, there are Matthews like this everywhere you turn. That at the right time, at the right moment, God places you there and places me there where we can make a difference in people's lives. Brother Siemens, of course, called me Sunday afternoon. Was he happy? <laughs> he, said, you're, he says, you're right, Brother Enos. He said he was ready. He said he prayed. He said, I've never seen anybody pray with such intensity and just laid it all out. He's still dealing with issues. It's not over yet. He said, I was surprised he didn't receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost, but we're believing that God would fill him with the Holy Ghost. And really, when I first started talking to him, I, you know, if you don't know somebody, you have to listen. But if we're apostolic, we need to listen with the heart. Because we can feel things in the Spirit. 
That's why if anybody is going to be saved in these last days, it has to be a work of the Holy Ghost. There's too much going on and going wrong in our world that if God doesn't undertake through the Holy Ghost, the job's not going to get done. That's why we've got to be filled with His Spirit every day because that's what's going to touch people's hearts and souls. How many believe that today? To get through the spirit of the world, to get through the sin that's out there, to get through the debauchery and things that a people have a hold of them. If the Holy Ghost doesn't move, nothing's going to happen. That's why we've got to pray revival. We've got to have a special way to pray, to, to have the hearts of people move towards God. And if we will do our part, can I tell you, the Lord will do His part. How many want to be a part of what God's doing tonight? Oh, hallelujah. Amen. And so we see this story of the certain Samaritan. You know, we're required to love our neighbors or the lost as we love ourselves. Now, most of us love ourselves, don't we? That's why you put yourself in bed at night. That's why you, uh, you brethren, shave your face in the morning. You comb your hair. You uh, put on clean clothes, thank God. <laughs> you put food in your fuel tank. You take care of yourself. Why? Well, you say, I don't love myself. Don't tell me that. You do. You can't wait to look yourself in the mirror as you stand there, as you brush your teeth in the morning. If you didn't care about yourself, you wouldn't look at yourself. You'd just brush your teeth. But you love yourself. Ladies, you love yourselves. But we're enjoined to and commanded to love the lost, love our neighbor like we love ourselves. Hello? Maybe there's a dynamic that the apostolic church can give ourselves to in this last day. Uh, neighbors can be, um, they can be different, you know. Uh, we lived in Germany for 30 years, and a lot of the Americans had German landlords that cut their grass. They would show up with a lawnmower and cut the grass. I never had a lawn. Or they had never had a landlord that cut my grass. They would go by while I'm cutting my grass, and they would wave at me. <laughs> so I come to America and buy a little house, and uh, I got neighbors that's retired on the right side, and neighbors retired on the left side. And then behind us is a man that's still working, our neighbor who is of Czech descent. And you know what? Terry, Sebastian, will not let me cut my grass. It's my turn. But you know what? They are some of the best neighbors we have ever had. We sit in their house and we have dinner with them. They come to our house and they have dinner with us. They pray before they eat. They, we pray before we eat. We're almost like family because I'm telling you, I love Terry and Star because I'm praying for them that they'll come down to an altar someday and repent of their sins and be baptized in Jesus' name. They sit right over here for the Christmas program. And... They call us. When's the Christmas program? I'm glad I can tell them and, and bring them to church. And they know how we worship. Uh, we haven't got them there yet. But you know what? We can love them like we love ourselves. I don't love him because he cuts my grass. I did at first. I thought that was great. <laughs> 
But it goes beyond that because for him, it comes from the heart. And uh, you can't help but like a person like that. Of course, when her father died suddenly out on the East Coast, she was leaving early in the morning by herself because he was out of town. And as she pulled out the driveway in the front of the house, I waved her down, stuck my hand inside of her van and laid my hand on her and prayed for her in Jesus' name. You know, that has an effect on people when we pray for them. People want to be prayed for. In fact, we, we prayed right there in McDonald's. Something good happened at that McDonald's. <laughs> Is that we held hands there and got a hold of God. We didn't, did we care who heard us? Now, we didn't pray at the top of our voices because God's not deaf. You know, if you can meet somebody in Walmart and pray for them, you don't have to scream to where the manager comes running. God's not deaf, but we can still pray wherever we are. When we'd have our spring conference in Berchtesgarden, Germany, uh, we would almost take over a whole hotel, but they also have other had other guests in there. So I'd have to, you know, we had military guys that get up at 4 o'clock in the morning and pray like there's nobody within five miles of them. And, of course, we got a few complaints, and I'd have to tell them, look, God's not deaf. All he wants you to do is get in contact with them. But at 5 o'clock in the morning, just remember, there are other guests in the hotel, and God's not deaf. But he wants us to pray. How do I know that? I remember when we had the first Gulf War, I was getting all kind of uh, telephone calls, uh, emails, information of young men who were getting ready uh, to go over to Iraq. And uh, the parents would say, would you please go find my son or go find my husband and pray for them before they leave? So I would, when I would get that kind of a request, uh, uh, I would go and find the military unit. And, of course, when I would get there, of course, they're in the middle of preparations. And I remember talking to the first sergeant of one company, and I said, told him who I was. And I work with military ministries with the United Pentecostal Church. And you got a member of your company whose parents have asked me to come pray for them. Now, was I embarrassed to tell that? captain that I wanted to pray for one of his members did I get any hard time from them no they all wanted to be prayed for so this one particular man I found him out in the company street over by the dumpster he was working on something some kind of equipment I told him who I was and I said uh, do you mind if I pray for you he said yes please pray for me so we went over behind uh, by the dumpster, and I laid my hands on him, and it kind of got quiet all around and began to pray for him. Really, they all wanted to be prayed for. I, I went by a room, and all the, 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 the E-6 sergeants and all were sitting in there, and they said, pray for us. You know, if someone wants you to pray for them, pray for them. I remember another young man was over in Mannheim, and uh, the military unit was all lined up in the company street, and I'd already made contact with, with the company commander, and I said, there's a man in your company. I don't know him. I couldn't pick him out uh, from uh, 100 people, but uh, he has called and wants me to pray for him before he gets on uh, the ship to go over to Iraq. And he said, what's his name? And I told him. He said, all right, in a few minutes I'll have him with you. And so here is 200 men standing in the street in all kinds of ranks and all, and platoon leaders and platoon sergeants and uh, lieutenants and different sergeants. And the company commander said, called out this young man, and he said, a pastor is here to pray for you. Did I get any laughs from those, that group of men? No, because 
they were facing, they thought, death. And I'm telling you, it's many times it's a life and death situation when we're praying for people. So he sent them over to me. My car was uh, with a couple of other cars. And he came and we stood between the cars in front of all those men and laid my hands on them and prayed for him. People want to be prayed for and they don't care if you pray for them. Well, I got one amen. Me. <laughs> so what am I inviting you to do tonight? I'm inviting us to have compassion upon those that obviously need a touch of God in their hearts and lives. Not everybody is hungry for God. But the Lord will bring to your pathway those that are searching. Why not when we get up in the morning pray, Lord, send somebody to my pathway. When we pray that way, look out. It's going to happen. If we will listen to that sweet, small voice inside, it's an exciting thing to be a part of what God does. If we will say, here I am, use me. When I got home from Vietnam, I was going to Indiana University. We lived up on 51st Street. We moved from 75th Street where my in-laws lived. And I remember my mother-in-law saying to me when we moved to 51st Street from 75th Street, she said, well, Arlie, why don't you just move back to Germany? And I'm thinking in the back of my mind, I'm going to. With the Lord's help. <laughs> but I said nothing. <laughs> so I was enrolled in school on the GI Bill. And <laughs> by the way, when we did go on the field, mom and dad never complained about our being gone, did they? But they prayed for us. I do know that. And so I'm doing, I'm doing my studies at home, and while I'm studying, the Lord said, I want you to go down to main campus and uh, just go down there. Didn't tell me who, what, where, or why. Just told me, um, he told me where. Just go down to main campus. And I was attending Indiana University, Purdue University, uh, there in Indianapolis, so I didn't have the car. My wife was working. She had the car. So I got on the bus, rode down College Avenue, and then transferred and went on uh, to, the, to the area where the school was. And all this while, I'm praying, Lord, well, what is it? what's going on here? All he said was go. If the Lord says go, you know what you do? You G.O. You go. <laughs> and so... Sometimes he doesn't tell you. Maybe if he told us everything, we'd argue with him or whatever. I, I mean, I got to study for this test, you know. And so it took me about an hour to get down there, and, and I walked up to the, main, uh, to the main administration building, and also there were classrooms there, and I just kind of stood there, and I said, All right, Lord, here I am. And waited there and waited. And pretty soon, a young man came out of the building. And he had a beard on, but for some reason, I was able to recognize him. Brother Koppel, I can't think of his first name right now. And she can't either. It goes with the turf. But here is a young man that I had known five years before and had not seen him since I've been home from Vietnam because he wasn't going to church anymore. So I said to him, I said, what are you doing here? He said, what are you doing here? I said, the Lord sent me here. He said, that's amazing because I'm taking a final examination and they don't, they do not let you out uh, of a final examination unless you turn your paper in and you're done. He said, but 
I just felt this urgency to get up and get out of the room, to come out here and get some fresh air. And so I asked the prophet, I'm not going to cheat. I'm not going to look up anything. I just need to go outside and get some fresh air. What he really needed was a rebaptism of the Holy Ghost. And so I couldn't have, I, I, I couldn't have uh, planned that. I, I didn't even know he was going to school. Someone said, I really enjoy your stories that you told last week. I said, well, yeah, yeah, you know, some of them are true. (laughs) And one of my friends said, you couldn't make up any of those stories. I'll just tell you, they all are true. It's amazing what God can do because he loves people and he has compassion upon them. This man was beaten and thrown to the side of the ditch. And we find that a priest came by and walked to the other side of the road. And then a Levite who was also a minister in the temple saw the man there. He had been beat up. Uh, that, you know, this was, this was like a type of Satan who only destroys people, tries to destroy them. And, and so the interesting thing is both of these people who were involved in ministry in the temple, I'm sure that they were coming from ministry in the temple, but they didn't have any compassion on this man who had been beaten and left bleeding beside the right, uh, side of the road. No compassion. But along comes this certain Samaritan. Now, Jesus was talking to Jewish people. And when he said a Samaritan came along, I'm sure that some of them thought, who's he? What's a a Samaritan to us? They didn't hold them in very high regard. Yet when this man came to where he was, the Bible says he saw him. He had compassion on him. He didn't look at his nationality. He looked at it. Here was a person who was hurting and bleeding. And it says, the Scripture says, that uh, he then went to him. He bound up his wounds. He poured in oil and wine and then set him on his own beast and brought him to an end. And he took care of him. He was moved by compassion, sympathy, or he was moved by pity. You know, we we can't be so heavenly minded that we aren't any earthly good. But uh, we must also be careful that we're not so heavenly minded that we are no earthly good. But it's all right to be heavenly minded. But we're still down here. Our feet are still on terra firma. And... uh, I believe God brings things to us to allow us to be used in His kingdom. We just can't stand back. We've got to really see things as they really are. And when somebody is hurting, I mean really hurting, not somebody who's just panhandling, but somebody that's hurting. You ever been hurting? I got a friend. Uh, he's a cycle friend from Germany, and his his email um, uh, what do you call it? His, what he uses, his address is hurting for certain. Now, if you've ever ridden a bike, you're going you're going to hurt. But his is hurting for certain. There are people today that are hurting for certain, and we need to be spiritually attuned to where we can be of assistance to them. Now, I'm not talking about humanitar- just a humanitarian approach. But I mean to meet the spiritual needs of their souls. If they want to see Jesus, I'm going to tell you that they will see him in us when we take the time to really see them and to feel what they feel. We must go to them and not wait for them to come to us. Although often the Lord will send people to us. And I have found that many, many times in my life and help bind up their wounds how do you do that spiritually you 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 give them hope some people don't have any hope in life 
this young man, his wife has left him. I don't know if he has children. He didn't mention that. I didn't pry. But you could tell his life was in shambles, and he was, he was like he was in the sea grasping for something for safety. I'm glad we can throw them the lifesaver of Jesus Christ and the gospel. Can you say amen to that? We must be willing to talk to them about the good news, that Jesus loves them. They don't feel loved. But I'm telling you, when we were talking to Matthew, we said, you know, the Lord loves you, and not only does he love you, but he actually gave his life that you might have a new life. And then we've got to lead them to the oil and wine experience, the baptism of the Holy Ghost. I want to see Terry and Star baptized in water and baptized with the Spirit. You have a neighbor. What's his name? What What are their names? I've lived in places where if you ask who, left, who lived next to you, they couldn't tell you. Maybe they didn't want to know. Uh, we had some neighbors in Germany that they weren't from heaven. You can draw your own conclusions and you would be right. They set fire to their house on the second floor. They had an awning. The, a blanket was caught on fire, so they threw it out the window and it landed on the awning. The awning caught fire. Someone called the firemen or the fire department, the fire blare, they call them. And as I heard them coming in the distance, I jumped out. They had this horrible dog. He would bite you just to have spite. He was the most ugliest dog, and he knew it. He didn't have one friend in the world. I don't think he liked anybody in that house. I had to put a big stick by the door, by my front door. When I walked out, if he was out, I had that stick in my hand. I called the German police, and I said, this this is a vicious dog. He tries to bite people. He says, has he bitten you yet? I said, no. He said, we can't do anything until he bites you. Well, that's great logic, you know. And so this dog is in the backyard, and this thing is burning. But he had a little sense, because when I jumped over the fence with the fire extinguisher, he ran to the other end of the yard. Of course, I was pumping that thing. <laughs> Those neighbors were interesting. But all they needed really was God. They were full of the devil, but they needed to be full of the Spirit. Hey, they would have told you that. They were interesting people. We got to talk to the daughter and the, and the young son a couple of times, but, oh, Lord. Well, you just never know the impact that you have by living and doing the right thing. They can't forget that. They can't get away from that. We've had men come to the military district and, uh, and not live right, but we just keep loving them and, and uh, invite them to church and, and uh, uh, being kind to them when they did show up and pray for them, and they would leave. And then years later, you get a letter in the mail, I am so sorry that we didn't do the right thing while we were over there. We're in a good church now, and... and uh, we're uh, working in Sunday school, and I'm thinking, where were you when we needed you? But, you know, it takes time for people to come around to do what they know to do right. But we're all involved. We have to do what we can do to help the Lord reach people. How many want to reach your neighbors with God? They would be some of the happiest people. You say, well... Maybe you got neighbors like I had. I don't know. But you know what? Nobody, no one is impossible for God to touch with his love. You say, well, you don't know some people that I know. Totally worthless. Winston Churchill said, nobody's worthless. You can use them for a bad example. <laughs> 
Nobody is hopeless because Jesus has brought us hope. Oh, hallelujah. I love the Lord tonight. I didn't get finished. I never get finished. Anybody behind this pulpit never gets finished. But we just kind of kind of try to wind it up. He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. I'm telling you, the Lord means for there to be joy in the hearts of men and women. That's what I love about this church, the joy that we feel when we worship and lift up Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. I'm telling you, if people out there could just feel what we feel in a service here, we wouldn't have enough room to put them here. I believe there are people out there that you're going to be instrumental in touching their lives with compassion and the gospel. And what a beautiful thing to see them come in, repent, to get baptized and receive the Holy Ghost. We can spend eternity together with the Lord who has come to seek and to save them that are lost. We want to be a part of God's mission. The angels can't do it. We've got to do it. Let's stand right now. My time is up. Let's lift our hands to heaven right now and say, Lord, let me feel empathy, sympathy. Oh, God, have compassion.